In the previous lecture, we have finished our discussion by showing a variant, a possible variant of pump probe transient absorption spectroscopy, which uh, would have both time and frequency resolution. That is, the assumption was, what about if we excite by pulses narrow in frequency around some frequency omega, omega zero, and uh, probe by a very broad pulse so that we get an absorption which basically exclusively assumes that we have excited only in a very specific spectral region of the system that we study. So if we compare this to the system which we study, we might have a ground state and several excited states. Let's assume that we want to know what happens when we excite the state E, which has a transition frequency omega zero. So we take this very narrow pulse and excite around the state E. So only the state E is excited. And then we assume that we can follow processes of energy transfer, for instance, by probing the whole problem by a very broad pulse, which has a infinitely broad spectrum and detects basically the absorption equivalently on all frequencies. That would be an ideal, ideal pump probe experiment from the sort of spectral point of view. The problem with this is that the same picture in time domain looks not so favorably anymore. So if I look at the time t, I will first excite around time minus t. So this would be, let's say, zero here where I have my infinitely broad and therefore infinitely short probe pulse. So this is the probe. And this is the probe and the pump pulse. The problem with the pump pulse is the narrower it is in frequency, the broader it is in time domain. So this here would be the pump. And even though here we do not have an overlap, so there is some sort of a nice separation of pump and probe pulse, you can see that because the pulse is probe, there is an uncertainty, relatively high uncertainty in the frequency or in the time at which we excite the system and we probe it at one specific time, which is, which is, which is ideal. So by actually getting more spectral resolution, we are losing time resolution. So here we have a here we have a problem of having a trade-off between the frequency resolution and the time resolution. There is a rule which looks basically like uh, Heisenberg uncertainty relations, which says that the delta omega and delta t they are actually inversely related. So this is a big problem for pump probe, or let's say for certain readings of it, certain interpretations of it. And we will try to overcome this by constructing a different type of uh, spectroscopy. I mean, I can already tell in advance that this problem cannot be overcome without uh, losing something else or without some tricks. This is a fundamental uh, relation between uh, delta omega and delta t, but we can kind of see through it. We can construct an experiment which in some sense provides us both the uh, high frequency and high temporal resolution. It's not so completely hopeless as this relation uh, shows. However, before that, we want to understand how it occurs in our formalism that a narrow pulse, frequency narrow pulse, excites only one state or excites only a limited number of states. Or in other words, we now want to ask what is the effect of the finite width of the pump pulse on the pump probe measurements. And obviously also we want to ask whether we can somehow compensate for that effect. And we will see that in certain sense, it is possible as long as we cover the states with enough bandwidth, that is with the spectrum of the pulse, we can compensate partially for the effect of a finite pulse uh, width. And we have to realize that so far our formulation of pump probe was with infinitely broad and that is infinitely short temporally pulses both on the pump and probe side. Okay, so let's have a look how we can formulate pump probe experiment with finite pulses. So let's define our pulses for the 
sake of the present experiment so at team equals zero we are going to have a narrow and well separated probe pulse so this is the probe and before that comes the pulse that we will now assume to be finite i mean i'm drawing a finite probe pulse too but let's assume that it's it's actually really really narrow and here we would have a relatively temporally broad pulse that represents the uh, the pump and it is important to say that pump pulse occurs in our considerations of the pump probe spectroscopy twice because it's the pulse that comes that represents both the sort of k1 pulse with the direction k1 and the pulse k2 so in the pump probe the pump pulse occurs actually twice in our perturbation theory so it's almost like having two pulses in our experiment so the first pulse occurs twice simply we will represent the pump pulse by an amplitude time dependent amplitude of the pump pulse which uh, we will write like this and the frequency part we will assume that this thing has a, a frequency omega so this is the complex representation of the pump pulse and here will be the probe pulse which will be very narrow so a pump and a probe are different and it doesn't have any delay with respect to the zero so we have the last t here and we have nothing like that in the in the probe pulse okay and as a side note as i already said we have to really keep in mind the pump pulse occurs twice in the perturbation theory and very important is also that pump precedes probe okay the third order polarization that we assign to this problem can be written like this it depends on the difference between the first and second pulse but first and second pulse are exactly the same i mean we are st still thinking even about pump probe in terms of a three pulse experiment but in fact the first pulse of a pump probe experiment represents the first two pulse of a three pulse experiment sorry for the confusion but uh, it's very important that we keep in mind that pump probe is still a third order experiment despite the fact that only two pulses occur in it okay so there is a the dependence on tau is such that tau can be considered zero because the first two pulses overlap perfectly they are actually represented by one pulse then there is a delay between the second a bit between the the pump and probe pulses which is of the length capital t and then there is a normal time and writing this in terms of our perturbation theory we can say that this polarization is equal to an integral from zero to infinity over all the possible delays between interactions that happen with these pulses so we inter integrate still over delays tau one tau two and tau three for instance the delay tau one is the delay between the first and second pulse or interactions in the first and second pulse and all that happens actually inside this first pulse so we may for instance have a contribution from the sort of uh, yellow occurrence of the of the first pulse and the red occurrence of the first pulse and their mutual delay i mean now delay between the interactions that is one of the possible values of tau one for instance here so we have a response function of the third order which depends on these delays and if you look at the earlier lectures of our of our course you find that the three laser pulses or that the field consisting of three laser pulses or three perturbation pulses would combine 
with this uh, third order nonlinear response, third order response in sort of a convolution of the third order. So it would look like this. We will add the pulses to the integral in this way. That is something that we have already discussed. And the nonlinear response can be decomposed into Liouville pathways. So the response is a sum of kind of sub responses to each of which we assign one Liouville pathway through the states of the system. So it's a sum of Liouville pathways. And when we specify a direction to which we look in our experiment, we can actually limit the number of pathways that contribute to only a certain type of pulse. So we look into the direction minus k1 plus k2 plus k3, which in our case means actually minus k pump plus k pump plus k probe so that is k probe and in here in this direction we consider interaction order That is how uh, the interaction with pulses is organized. The interaction order will be one, two, three. That means there will be an interaction with pulse one, then an interaction with pulse two, and then an interaction with pulse three, which in this case actually means that there is going to be, let's say the interaction with the yellow and then interaction with the red and then interaction with the probe. Or there is a possibility that the interaction will go in the, in the order 2, 1, 3, which means that this is an interaction with, for instance, red, and then yellow, and then, uh, and then probe. This we have actually considered in terms of rephasing and non-rephasing pathways. We will show uh, with the expressions how this actually works, but we have to assume that once this first pulse is considered twice, and I choose one of them to be the pulse one, and then the pulse, then there is going to be pulse two. They will contribute in such a way that in some cases the pulse one will precede the pulse two, or the interactions with pulse one will precede the interactions with pulse two, and there symmetrically has to be exactly the opposite also present. So pulse 2 will come before pulse 1. We have drawn here a situation in which the red pulse comes after the yellow pulse, but there is clearly, if I integrate over all possible orders of interactions in the first pulse, in the pump pulse, there clearly can also be the other contribution. The, the inverse contribution. So there is a symmetric contribution from the so-called rephasing and non-rephasing pathways. So I will write it here. Again, it will be a little bit more clear when we write down the expression. So this will lead to a contribution of rephasing pathways. And this will lead to contribution of the so-called non-rephasing pathways. And they all have to be uh, have to be considered for the evaluation of the polarization. All right, so let's do that. So we write now P3 T capital T and zero, so I'll stop writing, writing the tau in a while. We know that this can be written using the Liouville pathways, and we will now only collect always the pathways of rephasing type and the 
pathways of non-rephasing type and kind of collapse them together in one expression because we don't need the details of the pathways. At the moment, we don't need the details of the pathways. It is just important to realize that we can write the response function in the following way. There's going to be i divided by h bar to the third power. I forgot a h bar now. That's not so important. Then uh, there always was a prefactor e to the power of minus i omega t minus tau, where t is a normal time and tau is now equal to, uh, equal to zero. Now, there is an integral, zero to infinity, tau three, tau two, tau one. And then we have the Liouville pathways. And here we have the rephasing ones, depending on these three arguments. And here we have, uh, we will write out the envelopes of the pulses that contribute to this particular signal, which actually the, the whole the whole trick was that if you if you remember back how, how we worked with uh, with the response functions written as a sum of Liouville pathways, we have already found what kind of phase factor these uh, Liouville pathways have, and that the phase factor had to cancel roughly with the phase factor occurring in the combination of the pulses. So we had the envelopes, There's, there was a, the third pulse, that's the probe pulse, second pulse, and the first pulse, now we assume tau equals zero, so the first and second pulse, they have the same factor or they, they have the same argument uh, originating from the position of the pulses. So these two we will at later assume uh, to be the same, so two and one, but I am keeping the notation here uh, for you to see that there is a difference in the arguments that are assigned to the interactions or the, these are delays between the interactions with the pulses. So they enter the same pulse twice in different ways. So these indices here, they will later be turned into the pump index. Basically saying that this is a pump pulse. And this here is the probe pulse. <clears throat> but for the time being, it's important to keep these things separate so that we can actually clearly see what we are doing. Now, if you combine all the pulses and their phase factors together, you will end up with a common phase factor that looks like this. And with that also, we get the prefactor, which depends only on T and tau. So this one here, we've got also by combining all the phase factors that come with the, uh, with the pulses here. This combination of amplitudes also has the phase factor that comes from the combination of the k-vectors. That's also important. And we are looking only in that direction, so we are not going to write that phase anymore because that has been handled, that has already been integrated, so to say. But it is important that we are looking at the signal in this particular direction. So this is not all. This still is missing one important part and that's the part which comes from the other, the second possible ordering of the interactions. So we have big plus here and again i to the third power. Interestingly for the non-rephasing pathways we are still getting the same overall, overall phase contribution in terms of tau and t and still tau is equal uh, zero. I'm writing it here just to make sure that we understand the situation generally. There's going to be an integral. We are considering so-called non-rephasing pathways. So this R here represents a sum of non-rephasing pathways. They all have a specific uh, phase factor, namely such a phase factor that it cancels 
with the following one with omega tau 3 minus tau plus tau 1 actually so that is what distinguishes the rephasing pathways and non-rephasing pathways so omega it's also very important to notice here omega that is here is the frequency of the pulse and the non-rephasing and rephasing pathways they have roughly resonant but in general not exactly resonant phase factor so here for instance this is going to have a phase factor minus i omega and now whatever transition is there so for instance state n and g and it has the same contribution when it comes to the dependence on tau 3 and tau 1 but there is a minus here we have pl uh, here we have plus the frequency is slightly different or might be slightly different but they have to be relatively close for, for this to work and these guys have the same argument so one's plus one minus they roughly cancel each other so that the integral is is big so here we have e to the power of minus i omega n g tau 3 plus tau 1 that's how the non-rephasing pathways contribute and that cancels with the very similar phase factor with a similar frequency and with a plus that's how actually we have selected the pathways only in situations that the phase factors do cancel this way Lewell pathways can contribute and let's let us finish the expression here we have now a 3 t minus tau 3 that's fine and here we have now the pulses a2 or contributions a2 and a1 coming however in inverse order so let's write it so that we first write a1 star now that's the minus k1 contribution and that looks now t plus capital T because this specifies where the pulse is centered and this is the pulse that now comes second so it must be minus tau 3 minus tau 2 and the pulse that comes third is the one without complex conjugation so it's T2 T plus capital T this specifies where the pulse sits and this is when it occurs all right so uh, maybe I said that actually the other way around so the first pulse that interacts here is the 2 then there is 1 and then there is 3 so this is the order of interaction so here we have the order of interaction 2 1 3 and in this situation here we have the order 1 2 3 now the expressions they look very similar they look very similar but they are they are not we will see that, that these contributions are somehow complementary or they combine together in a in a relatively nice way uh, we are now after actually the effects of the finite width of the pulses one and two that both represent the pump pulse so we will assume still that the probe is um, probe is very broad we will assume that a3 t which is basically the a probe t is some a probe and delta t so a probe is the amplitude of the probe pulse okay so let's rewrite now uh, this with um, the assumption that we have just made that is the delta pulse or Dirac delta form of the probe pulse that lets us to get rid of one integral and also sets tau 3 equal to t so writing now our results we are still interested in just the p3 we get that this is i to the third power e to the power of uh, well we'll see now minus omega t a probe here is an integral now only over tau 2 and tau 1 still we have rephasing pathways 
and in the rephasing pathway now we have the first argument equal to t and then there is tau 2 and tau 1 and here we are supposed to have the phase uh, phase factor e to the power of i omega tau 3 but tau 3 is is now t so there's going to be plus i omega t and minus tau 1 and the, the rest is basically just the amplitudes we, we have the amplitude a a2 and a1 a2 with T plus capital T minus T minus tau 2 and here we have a 1 star T plus capital T minus T minus tau 2 minus tau 1 so we can take a red pen and cancel several contributions so this T will cancel with this this with this and this with this so there is no more lowercase t present if we look at the non-rephasing path we would probably see something very uh, similar so uh, well we don't have to write it explicitly i just write three dots and that is uh, going to mean the complementary non-rephasing contribution so wherever it will not be clear what's actually coming from the non-rephasing Part, I will write it explicitly, but as long as it all looks nicely as an analogy, we'll keep expressing it by three dots. Okay, we have simplified the expression to some extent, and let's simplify it even more. Now we will write the rephasing pathway or rephasing pathways in terms of the evolution superoperators or elements of evolution superoperators that we have already discussed some time ago. Now, because this is a sum over all the pathways, we have to still assume that the pathways are different. But what is the difference? The difference is that, let's say, they start with exciting different states, for instance, but they have the same, same general form. So we will keep writing this same general form without specifying what states contribute uh, except, of course, some situations where we will need those, those details. It will be clear, hopefully, uh, what I mean when I, uh, when I write it down. So the expression that we have here now equals to i to the third power. We have the A probe. We uh, also have the part of the response functions that depends on t. I mean, the response individual response functions, they always had this dependence they, they looked as some evolution super operator with some indices which depends on t then there was some evolution super operator again with some particular indices depending on tau 2 and super operator element depending on tau 1 so unless again unless i need the lewell pathway contribution to specify which states are used, I will not specify what indices will be put on these places in the superoperator. Uh, so I'm actually meaning some particular elements of the evolution superoperator, but I will just not say which ones until I really need that. So I can write the contribution now so that we have we start with the amplitude of the prom, uh, probe pulse we have the part of the response function that depends on, on t. Then we have an integration over tau 2. And I can collect the part of the response function that depends on tau 2 together with the amplitude a2 and its dependence on capital T and minus tau 2. Okay, and then there is an integral from 0 to infinity over tau 1 and in case of tau 1 we have slightly more things we have u tau 1 we have e to the power of minus i omega tau 1 and we have the a1 star capital t minus 
tau 2 minus tau 1. Okay, so that is a crucial separation which we cannot do in general, but we can do it in this particular case specific approximation that we use for the dynamics of our system. We said that we describe it by reduced density matrix and at every interval of the response we can actually say how this response depends or how, how this um, reduced density matrix evolves and we can specify it by uh, an evolution super operator. So we've used that assumption now so that we've separated at the end the response to integrals that can be performed one one by one. We can actually perform this first integral. After that is done, we get a function that depends on, on tau2 and we can integrate it in the next step. Okay, so for a while now, we'll be actually concentrating on this last integral. So on the green integral here. And if you look at it, it actually does look like an integral from zero to infinity, the tau1 of a function, let's call it f tau1, is a function of tau1, that's this here, and a function, say g, of, let's call it x minus tau1, where x, in our case, is capital T minus tau2. So that's this second function. So we will call this g, and this we will call F. So it's an integral of these two functions and well one should be able to recognize this basically as the so-called convolution. So this is this is a convolution of two functions f I mean the usual way this is how, how or often it is written in this way it's like f star g which is a function in this case of x and is defined as the integral from zero to infinity d, for instance, tau f tau g x minus tau. There is a very important result about the convolution, namely that if I make a Fourier transform over that function, so that means I have to integrate over x and perform the integral with i omega x, I do it to this specific function of x, that I get a product of Fourier transforms of uh, the function g and, and f. So f omega, for instance, is equal to, to this Fourier transform. That's a very important result which we will now use. We have the convolution now and we can we can therefore write that the convolution itself as a function of x is an inverse Fourier transform of the product of the Fourier transforms. And that's what we will use here. This is an important kind of consequence of the properties of, uh, of convolution. Now we can connect uh, this property of convolution with the properties of the functions that we are actually convoluting here. So first of all, you remember, you hopefully remember, our complex line shape, complex absorption line shape, complex line shape. That was a function which we got by Fourier transforming the evolution superoperator, actually evolution superoperator element. Uh, coherence element. So we had the evolution superoperator element that looked, for instance, like this. In the rephasing pathways, we have the first interval characterized by this element of the evolution superoperator because rephasing pathways always start with a set of interactions. Let's say they always start with the interaction from the right hand side. So here is the excited state E, here is G, and the first time evolution is therefore the GE, 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 uh, GE element. So these are the rephasing, rephasing diagrams. 
they start simply with this set of interactions. Maybe the second interaction can be on the other side, but there's always an interaction from the right hand side and the first interval is eg. So this function we have in our expression with a phase factor e to the pow power of minus i omega tau one, that's what we integrate. And we also know that this can be expressed always, or we have expressed it in that way, using the energy of the transition or the frequency of the transition in the following way. So there is some GE, GE, uh, which is slowly evolving. That's what we uh, always denoted by the tilde. And there is a factor I omega EG here. That's the factor in uh, in tau one. So altogether we can write there is a e to the power of i omega e g minus omega tau one, and that's the function that we want to integrate. Now we know that a Fourier transform that looks the following way: omega e g e g tau e to the power of i omega tau, which is nothing else than something like this, integral over omega u e g e g tilde tau minus i omega e g tau plus i omega tau. We know that this is the complex line shape of the transition eg with the argument omega minus omega eg. So this g e g omega defined as a Fourier transform of the slowly evolving eg that's a function or that's a line shape which is centered around zero in frequency. So this is frequency domain, here is zero, and here is, here is the line shape. This is, this is sort of its definition, and obviously the expression that we have, uh, that we have here is shifted to be centered around omega around omega e g. Now that's important to, to realize because we are going to use this function g e g or g n g for whatever state we will be looking at as centered around omega e g. It is also important to realize that in our expressions we don't have e g but g e. So we have something slightly different from the definition of the line shape. This will become extremely important in some other or in later part of this lecture, but it has its importance also here in what we are looking at now. So let's come back to what we have. We have u g e g e tau one e to the power of minus i omega tau one, that's a function that we want to Fourier transform in order to be able to use it with the convolution theorem. But the problem is that we want to express it using the line shape G E G, which actually contains the complex conjugated E G E G element of this evolution superoperator. The solution to this problem of expressing this through the function that was obtained by Fourier transform of a complex conjugated function is in actually considering here the inverse Fourier transform first. So if I take an inverse Fourier transform of this function, now we have to realize that we have to do the Fourier transform in a different variable than the omega which is already used here for the pulse frequency. So we can do the following. We have a function u g e g e tilde e to the power of i omega e g tau one. That's a different way how to write the u g e g e tau one. And here we have the i omega tau one. That's 
the function that we want to Fourier transform and we take a, an inverse Fourier transform of it. So that's going to look like this. Now a straightforward calculation will give us this. This is G E G E tau 1. We can collect all uh, the factors, all, all the phase factors into 1. Uh, one and this can be written as an integral over a complex conjugated version of this or let's say integral over the complex conjugated function so here we have to inverse the or um, pre precede everything with minus maybe g tau one complex conjugation and this is, if you look closely on it, is G E G of omega dash plus omega minus omega E G star. In other words, if we want to write it even more with detail, so omega dash is now uh, the frequency that we write on the axis of the, or we draw on the axis of the spectrum. It's complex conjugated, it's E G and it's omega i minus some shift with respect to the center and that shift delta is omega e g minus omega so that's the line shape that's how we will use the line shape as a fourier transform of the function that we are that that we want to use in the expression for for the for the response and we also have to find a Fourier transform or suitable representation uh, of the a1 star in our usage of convolution theorem so we will take this function and again use the inverse Fourier transform of it so we have the Fourier transform of the function i1 so we have tau 1 e to the power of minus i omega dash tau 1 and that equals to to this integral over a 1 tau e to the power of i omega dash tau complex conjugated that complex conjugation can be taken out of the integral completely so it's at the end a Fourier transform of the a1 normal Fourier transform but that Fourier transform is complex conjugated. So what we've arrived at now here is the Fourier transform of A, the way that we will use it in our usage of convolution theorem and here is the result for the line shape or let's say for this occurrence of the evolution superoperator element in our expressions. All right, that means we can now go back to the expression for polarization and our P3 as it depends on T and capital T is now I to the third power there is a probe there is UT which is the uh, segment the third segment of the response functions of the Liouville pathways and here everything is now integrated over over tau 2 here is the the second segment of the Liouville well pathway integrated with the A2, that is the amplitude of the second pulse, which is also the pump pulse, tau 2. And this is all multiplied now by the inverse Fourier transform. So it's inverse Fourier transform in the, finally this is the uh, omega dash that is used here, the argument of that Fourier transform is T minus tau 2 that's uh, what we denoted as X before and here we will write our result from the Fourier transforms so we have e to the power of now G uh, G E G or let me write N G because it can be an arbitrary level it is start and it is it depends on if you can look at it omega dash and there is we write it minus 
minus omega eg minus omega. That's the detuning of the transition with respect to the exciting pulse. So that's, let's call it delta as before, but let's also give it the eg index. So this is the tuning, the tuning of the pulse from the transition. And the last term that is important to add to the expression here is a one star at omega dash. Okay, so this is it. Uh, and of course, plus three dots. This is how the other part, the non-rephasing part of the response going to contribute to, to P3. So we don't need to, we don't need to uh, well, do this uh, exactly yet. So before we go to the details of the second part of this expression, we'll just quickly think what it means, the expression that we have found here, what it possibly means for the result. So we have an expression G and G omega dash minus delta EG A1 dash A1 star omega dash here. So if we draw this as a function of omega dash, it would look like, like this. We will have the pulse spectrum, which is here the A1 omega dash, and we will have a shifted line shape with respect to that, that center. So for instance, here, this is going to be G and G of omega. So they overlap slightly or they may overlap perfectly, actually, if, the, if there's no detuning. And that overlap is Fourier transformed, in fact, um, at, certain, at certain time. So, I mean, it's not directly clear what this, uh, uh, what this exactly means, but the overlap is a function that, let's say, in the case that these are both Gaussians, will also look Gaussian, and uh, the inverse... A Fourier transform of a Gaussian is also a Gaussian, so we would get a Gaussian distribution in T minus tau 2. So this is a function which actually limits the possible values of tau 2 around the value of capital T. It's, it's basically because it has to somehow express the fact that the value of tau 2 is spread around the capital T around the center of the pulse. But we still don't see directly what this means for the amplitude of the contribution uh, of the particular level, which has the detuning from the laser pulse delta EG or delta NG in this case. It should actually be N rather because it, it has to be attributed to the state that we are looking at. So it's very difficult here from this expression to actually realize what does it mean. I mean, how the, the finite width of the pump pulse actually influences the amplitude of the, or, and, or phase or anything else of the, of the P3 polarization which goes into the signal. So we have to do something more to understand it. We will have to use some approximation that will be able to to tell us, or to, to actually confirm the intuitive assumption that the contribution of this effect should be only such that, let's say, when the pulse, the initial, the exciting pulse, doesn't have enough spectrum on a particular level, that this level is not going to be excited. Okay, so let's finish first the considerations for the non-rephasing part. And then we go back to kind of uh, looking at the, at the problem, what it all means. So the only difference we find in the non-rephasing part is the presence of the sine at the, at the phase factor e to the power of i omega tau 1. So there, there is once, uh, once uh, we have minus and once we have plus tau 1 in this expression. And also 
we have the pulses A1 and A2, A2 um, exchanged. So there is also pulse A2 now that we integrate with. So these are the two changes that we have to do in the expressions and everything else should be relatively easy so we'll go through it quickly. The difference sign in the exponential means that we will now use uh, Fourier transform and not inverse Fourier transform as before. Uh, I mean in the expression for the non-rephasing non -rephasing polarization of the third order. So this is the expression for the polarization. We have tau equals zero and this is the non-rephasing part of it and that is proportional to the i to the third power there is a probe amplitude ut all these things that we have written before and now we get the integral from zero to infinity d tau u tau 2 a1 star t minus tau and right after that the integral over the tau 1 u eg tau 1 e to the power i omega tau 1 a2 at t minus tau 2 minus tau 1 and this this the same way as we did before we turn the last part of this expression we turn into the integral over spectral of over the spectrum of the second pulse a2 so we'll get i to the third power a p r u t integral over tau 2 a1 star t minus tau 2 and here we get the expression for the convolution i mean this part this part here as before is understood as a convolution and it can be written as a inverse fourier transform or in our case here fourier transform of the product of the Fourier transforms of uh, UEG and A2. So we get T minus tau 2 here and GEG omega dash plus delta EG and A2 omega dash this is in full analogy in full analogy with the er earlier expression we've just used now the fact that there are some different signs in the exponentials so putting these two terms together we would get the full expression for the rephasing and non-rephasing part of the uh, third order polarization and now we want to turn this into something understandable. I mean, it's clear that in some sense the amplitude of the response is dependent on the overlap of the line shape, overlap of the line shape, that's here, and the spectrum of the pulse. Now it looks like it's it all depends on just one pulse, or, or let's say one instance of the three um, instances of the pulses in this expression uh, but we need to we need to go a little bit farther to see uh, to see how exactly these overlaps play out and another thing is it's not a pure overlap or simple overlap uh, it's a Fourier transform there is this exponential with e to the power of of i omega dash and some time argument so we have to in order to understand how does this play out? Uh, we will have to make some uh, some approximations which uh, are likely to be almost true in the uh, realistic situations uh, and only using them we could understand what's actually sort of going on in here. Also uh, an important thing is to see that as we said before 
we can do an excitation, selective excitation, because already here uh, you can see that if the, the pulse spectrum does not overlap at all with the line shape of the transition, uh, this integral will be zero and we will not be exciting something which uh, is not reached by the spectrum of the pulse, the A to omega here. So that's important. That is uh, already a result that confirms the debate that we had before about, let's say, trying to excite with pulses that are spectrally narrow to get uh, a spectral resolution at the excitation frequency. Nevertheless, despite having this result, we can still continue and uh, get or squeeze uh, some more expressions from what we have. And the task is now to figure out how to possibly correct the spectrum for the finite width of the pump pulse. So let's now work with a specific example. And that example or case will be the case where the line shape will be much narrower than the spectrum of the pulse. This, I mean, I'm not saying that it's always much narrower, but this is a situation which is actually fairly normal when you want to do some sort of reasonable spectroscopy with very high resolution. You want to actually cover your transition in full or several transitions and so on. So it is reasonable to assume that we will get something interesting from the case when the line shape is narrower uh, than the pulse. So we have a case, line shape, narrower than the pulse. And uh, well, of course, our narrower will be super narrow. We will assume that we can write the GE basically as a delta function. So realistic pulse might have some, our realistic line shape might look like this. Our case is you know, extremely narrow and the situation is such or the assumption that we want to do is such that the pulse, exciting pulse, this is the A pump of omega, is much narrower than, uh, than the uh, line shape of the, uh, of the, of the spectrum. Okay, so with this assumption, with this assumption, we can evaluate the following expression. The integral over t minus tau 2. And here we have delta omega dash plus omega minus omega eg. That's what we had before a1 star omega dash. This obviously, because we have a delta function here, evaluates into e to the power of minus i omega eg minus omega. That is the that is actually the delta eg with t minus tau two time argument, and here we have a one star delta eg. Okay, because we, we can see that the delta function actually means that omega dash is equal to delta, delta eg. Okay, so using this, we can now write the expression for the polarization again. P3 T capital T is i to the third power. probe amplitude, this is common to all our expressions. And now we have an integral delta tau u to a2 t minus tau 2 a1 delta eg star. And here is e to the power 
of minus i delta e g t minus tau two. So we seem to have we see, seem to have some uh, Fourier transform again here. Mm, properly, the, the a one does not belong does not belong to to the integral. So this is plus again the non rephasing part, and we can we can continue in evaluating this. So we take a one star out of the integral, and we will also assume that the u tau two evolves slowly. It evolves slowly uh, means that uh, basically it will not. Well, this assumption, this assumption is only useful when or would be valid basically only when the evolution of tau two is slower than the change of the of a two of the width of the pulse. So we will assume that this is basically constant and can be taken out of the integral because it evolves whatever whatever for instance the changes of the populations and so on in time which might look like something like this they have to be slower than the change of the pulse so this is this is the a2 and this is for instance the p of population of some state uh, n so this is this is a2 and population so the population the dynamics change which comes from u uh, ut we don't actually in our expressions here distinguish uh, very well between the intervals of evolution and the u tau 2 and ut that we have here these two they actually come from different, uh, these are slightly different evolutions. I mean, as we have seen from the diagrams, the middle interval is always uh, an evolution in the excited state or the ground state, whereas the interval with T that uh, or tau, the first and third, they involve optical coherences, so field, so, so uh, dynamics, which is, which is very fast, whereas the, the evolution in the excited state does not have those very fast optical uh, frequencies and therefore therefore we can assume very well that it uh, actually develops uh, slower than the pulse envelope all right so using this information or using this assumption we can we can do the following we can write that this is i to the third power apr u t and we take u tau 2 out of the out of the integral well we have here obviously integral over tau 2 and the rest the rest of the or the the integration that we have here can be actually assumed to be sort of a Fourier transform it's not a Fourier transform completely but it's basically a Fourier transform the a1 star delta eg out of the integral and here is the integral a2 t minus t minus tau 2 e to the power of minus i delta eg t minus tau 2 so in this last integral we would have to we would have to make a substitution for uh, for for tau 2 um, Basically, we would say something like t minus tau two is some some tau dash, and or let's do it basically. Let's let's say tau dash is equal t minus tau two, so d tau dash is minus d tau. Tau dash at infinity is minus infinity. Tau dash at zero is t. So putting this together, we would get i to the third power a e r u t u tau and a one star a delta e g an integral from 
t to minus infinity of minus d tau 2 that can be easily reorganized as integral over d tau 2 from minus infinity to t and here we have a well this is sorry this is this is uh, tau dash a to tau dash e to the power of minus i delta e g tau dash so this we can assume to be basically i mean the, the t has to be has to be larger than the than the uh, or or t has to be um, larger than the width of the pulse that's actually a typical assumption because when it's not like that we have pulse overlaps and problems with orderings of pulses and all sorts of things so if we if we neglect that we can say that this is basically a2 Fourier transform and at the um, frequency delta eg so putting this result together and again in in all cases we have to add that there is corresponding non-rephasing part so adding this together we can write that p3 t capital t is proportional to the i to the third power a p r u t u tau t and here we have an expression that contains that contains two integrals one star delta e g and here we have minus infinity t d tau dash a2 tau dash e minus delta e g tau dash and the second uh, expression will be very similar except except so the start will be the same we will have a1 delta eg and an int and the set sim and a similar integral basically the same integral just with a different different sign and i think it's going to be like this 1 star tau dash e delta e g tau e g tau dash so we have here uh, very similar integrals and we can we can try to put these put these things together now let's assume let's assume um, let's make a simplification that we'll assume that uh, the a1 and a2 amplitudes are real So now we can actually all collapse together a probe u t u tau t and here we have a and let's say they are real and real and the same equal to a so then we have a at delta e g and here we will have an integral minus infinity to t d tau dash a tau dash minus tau dash and here plus the same thing but with a different sign And these two things we can still collect together we can actually show for instance the first of the uh, of the two of the two integrations they can be they can be changed by introducing a substitution 
two tau with two dashes equals minus tau dash and then we get what then we get tau two dashes is minus d tau two dashes is minus uh, d tau one dash and tau two dashes at minus infinity is infinity tau two dashes at t is minus t so we get integral from infinity to t of minus d tau two dashes that is an integral from t to infinity d tau two dashes and now we have a of minus uh, tau two dashes uh, which we may well assume that the, the pulse may well be assumed uh, will be assumed symmetric so this we will assume to be exactly the same as as a tau two dishes and here we have e to the power of i delta e g tau two dishes so we have we have this assumption of the symmetric pulse for instance a gaussian one okay so the first of the two integrals can be turned into the same integral as as below just from t to to infinity so altogether i can write the expression for p3 in the following way it will still contain two integrals but we could easily understand how they how they work and what they mean so here we have the time evolutions here we have the time evolutions and a delta e g and here we are going to have one we can collect the two integrals into one full Fourier transform so integral from minus infinity to infinity 2 dash a2 dash e to the power of i delta e g tau dash and plus we have a those parts of integrals that contain upper limits to t so from minus t to t sorry here we have to have a minus from minus t here too from minus t to t tau dash a tau dash e to the power of delta e g tau dash and again assuming that t is larger than the width of the pulse we can as we, we can collect these we can also think that this the second of the two integrals is a is a Fourier transform so what we what we finally get is i to the third power the amplitude u t u tau u tau 2 and two Fourier transforms of the pulse at delta e g so we have the tra Fourier transform and delta e g to the square and a, pre a factor of a factor of two which is which is actually unimportant okay so this is this is very important this is a result that we obtained considering uh, the polarization contribution or contribution to the polarization from uh, rephasing and non rephasing pathways combined together so for every rephasing pathway we also have a non-rephasing pathway and if we combine them together we get basically the same or very similar expression as before there is there is evolution in tau 2 there is t and there is a factor that multiplies that Liouville pathway which consists of the square of the spectrum of the pulse at the detuning between the pulse and the transition that's extremely important because that basically means uh, what does it mean to excite by finite pulse so if we have spectrum of the pulse 
here in blue this is the spectrum of the pulse a omega and we have transitions transitions at different frequencies always here we can symbolize them by the for instance the square of the transition dipole moment so these are transitions one two three four and we have always d3 to the second power here d4 to the second power now the value of d square enters the expression for the Liouville pathway but it is weighted now with the square of the pulse which is here uh, in the blue so so those transitions which are completely outside the uh, spectrum of the pulse for instance here the transition zero it will have a d0 square but it's not going to be i mean it's going to be weighted with an almost zero square of the spectrum of the pulse so that also means that uh, basically the transition or every pathway depending on the on the transitions that enter the expressions here uh, can be so as, as it is weighted with the spectrum of the pulse it is also possible to remove this weight by dividing the uh, spectrum by the by the by the square of the amplitude of the pump pulse so this is it's important to note that this is a pump pump pulse so we can when measuring the pump probe spectrum can be divided by the amplitude of the pump pulse square which is basically or that is the e pump square the, sp the spectrum to correct for pulse with or pulse spectrum and we mean the pump pulse spectrum here that's an important result that we have that we have just uh, just reach and uh, reach and it actually confirmed i mean of course i can only do this when there is a pump spectrum at the particular uh, the particular frequency so if i have transitions that are outside the spectrum of the pulse i cannot wait anything there i'm simply not exciting them um, and that confirms uh, the method that we've suggested before uh, that one could in principle scan the excitation frequency and the detection frequency or detect at every excitation frequency the full uh, spectrum and that would give us some sort of a excitation emission correlation plot, plot nice two-dimensional picture and as we said the only problem with this picture is that by uh, setting a narrow or high frequency resolution we are missing in, in our expressions uh, or in in our method the high temporal resolution and our task for the next uh, lectures will be to actually construct a methodology in which we can overcome this trade-off between the time and frequency resolution so if you allow me to have a little erratum here i want to explain uh, one little or correct one little mistake that i made um, in the expressions above you might actually worry a little bit about the tau 2 that appears here uh, when we actually took that tau 2 the or that expression out of an integral first without a good explanation and the second actually what the tau 2 would be what is the tau 2 is is not a value a parameter that we put in so the problem started here so we have here tau 2 and we integrate over tau 2 and we wanted to say when u uh, is evolving slowly the u tau 2 can be assumed constant but what will you what will you it should have and the answer is relatively obvious we have this expression a2 
t minus tau right after right after the u tau 2 and tau 2 is actually fixing the values of t2 to um, the values around capital T and if everything evolves slowly it means that this constant here is actually u at time t and that's important because time t now is a parameter external parameter of this method tau, uh, uh, capital T is the delay between between the pulses so that is what properly enters the uh, polarization that's this parameter so we have everywhere below that we have uh, outside the integral the value tau 2 we have to we have to write t and because this is really an erratum i'm not going to delete it i'm just really going to mark it explicitly where we have made that mistake all right it's here and here that means that also here and here all right so everything else is uh, basically fine clearly it's approximations uh, but uh, these approximations are reasonable and give us uh, an, a, a good picture of what is what is happening the important thing is that for the calculation of pump probe the third order polarization still here depends on t and capital t and it depends on amplitudes of the probe pulse which we have assumed to be to be ultra short here and the detuning of the pump pulse from the transitions that are involved here so again so that i don't have to do as extra erratum for that this expression here is approximate because it contains considerations of a single pair of Lewell pathways that are attributed to a particular transition and the pair always contains the rephasing and non-rephasing pathway all right, that's the end of the eratum.